Washingtonian Magazine once referred to Jeremy Gifford, the founder of Walters, as someone who knows how to pack a bar. Walters is located across the street from Nationals Park near the Centerfield Gate next to South Capitol Street. Garcia to the belt, the 0-2 to Perkins. Swinging a ground ball right side, Garcia dives, it's by him for a base hit. Adamas scores, headed for the plate, Freelich, he'll score, the throw into second, and the Brewers have the lead. Over to third goes Ortiz. Two-run single is a pinch hitter for Blake Perkins, and it's 5-3 Milwaukee. Now the 1-1. Contreras launches one to deep center field, way back it goes. Young can only look up, and it is long gone. That one almost halfway up the batter's eye hill. A tape measure home run for Contreras makes it 6-3 Milwaukee. And welcome to Nats Chat for Saturday, August 3rd, 2024. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Mark Zuckerman is off for this installment of the podcast, but it is nice to be with you on the only Nationals podcast for which there is a new episode for the morning after every Nats regular season game day, weekday, weekend, does not matter. Well, Friday night was pups in the park night. <laughs> at Nationals Park, and the Nats could uh, use some friendly pups right now. The Nats on Friday evening suffered a fifth consecutive loss, an 8-3 loss to the National League Central leading Milwaukee Brewers at Nationals Park in Game 1 of a three-game series. The Nats lost despite overcoming a 3-0 third-inning deficit. The Nats now are 49-61, and 12 games below 500, most games below 500, that the Nats have been in this regular season. Coming up later in the show, insight on two of the prospects who the Nats obtained in their trading of outfielder Lane Thomas to the Cleveland Guardians, as we will hear from Jason Prill, the voice of the Lynchburg Hillcats, who are the single-A affiliate of the Guardians. Jason is going to tell us about pitcher Alex Clemmy and shortstop slash third baseman slash second baseman Rafael Ramirez Jr. So, The Nats on Friday evening allowed at least five runs for a sixth time in nine games. So the Nats starting pitcher on Friday evening was Jake Urban. Uh, He came into the game having been good in each of his previous two outings, which came off him having been bad in each of his previous two outings. Uh, Urban on Friday evening officially allowed four runs in five and two-thirds innings. So that would qualify as not good. Gave up six hits, which were three doubles and three singles. He issued two walks. Uh, he recorded four strikeouts. He threw a lot of pitches, but also a lot of strikes. Uh, five and two-thirds innings, 110 pitches, but 72 strikes versus 38 balls. Interesting that Nats manager Davey Martinez allowed Jake Irvin uh, to throw 110 pitches. But, you know, I did not think that Irvin was, like, terrible in this game. Uh, The fourth run charge to him came with him out of the game. What really harmed him was the top of the second. Uh, He, in that inning, allowed three runs. Allowed the three runs on two doubles, a single, a walk, and a throwing error. The error was by center fielder Jacob Young. The doubles were an RBI double by Reese Hoskins off the left field warning track for a one nothing Brewers lead, despite him having been down in the count at one point one two and a one out opposite field. A two run double by the Brewers number nine batter Garrett Mitchell to the left center field gap. For a 3 nothing Brewers lead, Jacob Young on that play uh, actually came close to making what would have been a spectacular diving backhanded catch. So the top of the second was bad. The rest of the outing, not so much. Jake Irvin now for this regular season, 23 starts, ERA a 356 whip of 110. This really, though, was a bad game for the Nats bullpen. Five Nats relievers officially combined to allow four runs in three and a third innings and really only one of the five Nats relievers who pitched in this game was effective. Robert Garcia officially allowed one run in a third of an inning. He came into the game in the top of the six with a runner on third, two outs, and the game tied at three. He, to the first batter he faced, Sal Freelich, issued a two-out hit by pitch. Garcia, to the second batter he faced, Joey Ortiz, issued a two-out four-pitch walk. Garcia, to the third batter he faced, pinch hitter Blake Perkins, Gave up a two-out, bases loaded, opposite field, two-run single through the right side of the infield on an 0-2 pitch for a 5-3 Brewers lead. Jacob Barnes that allowed one run in one inning. He in the top of the seventh gave up a one-out solo homer by William Contreras on a bomb to center field for a 6-3 Brewers lead. The homer went a projected 439 feet per stat cast. 
Jose A. Ferrer officially allowed two runs in a third of an inning. Hita Brewers, a two-run eighth, faced four batters, but got just one out. Eduardo Salazar officially tossed a two-thirds of a scoreless inning, but he and that Brewers two-run eighth faced four batters and got two outs. He on his very first pitch, which came after an automatic ball due to a pitch clock violation. Yeah, he began his outing with a pitch clock violation. Gave up a one-out RBI single by Jackson Churio through the left side of the infield for an 8-3 Brewers lead. So Garcia, Barnes, Ferrer, and Salazar all having problems. The only truly effective Nats reliever in this game was Tanner Rainey, who tossed a perfect top of the ninth. So the Nats pitching does continue to falter here. Was so good for so much of this season. Has fallen off here in recent weeks. And also regarding Nats pitching on Friday was more disappointing news in the Cade Cavalli saga. So starting pitcher Cade Cavalli, he has been on the 60-day injured list since March 26 due to his recovery from Tommy John surgery that he underwent in March 2023. The thinking going into this season was that Cavalli would be ready to pitch in the majors by May or June. Well, we're now multiple days into August, and he's not close to being ready to pitch in the majors. Uh, Cavalli and his comeback from Tommy John's surgery has been set back by a bout with the flu, also has been set back by a dead arm. The latest plan had been for him to go to the Nats spring training facility at West Palm Beach, Florida to get to ramping up to be able to pitch in the majors at some point this season. But (laughs) seemingly out of nowhere, Cade Cavalli on Friday afternoon was in the Nats clubhouse at Nationals Park. Nats manager Davey Martinez during his pregame session with reporters on Friday afternoon was asked, uh, hey, uh, what up with Cade Cavalli? And Davey revealed that the Nats wanted to have Cavalli work with their strength and conditioning guy and then have him go to West Palm Beach. So understand that Cade Cavalli working in West Palm Beach is the process before the process of making another minor league rehab assignment. And it is after that minor league rehab assignment that we would see Cavalli pitch in the major. So Cavalli hasn't even started the process before the process. This Cade Cavalli situation has become maddening. Recovery from Tommy John surgery is supposed to take 12 to 15 months, with 15 months being on the very high end of recovery time. Cavalli underwent his Tommy John surgery more than 16 months ago now, and he's not even close to pitching in the majors. I mean, best case scenario now is that he'll make, what, two or three major league starts in September? And that's a best case scenario. That's assuming no more setbacks and no more surprises. Now, look, none of this is necessarily Cade Cavalli's fault or is the Nationals' fault, Davey Martinez, during his pregame session with reporters on Friday afternoon, said that Cavalli has not suffered another setback. It's not Cade Cavalli's fault that he got the flu or that he got a dead arm. And the Nats uh, very clearly are taking their time with Cade Cavalli. But you can't blame the Nats for taking their time with Cade Cavalli. But the whole situation is just so frustrating, right? Cade Cavalli per MLB Pipeline is the Nats' number five overall prospect and number one pitching prospect. He is a key piece of this Nats rebuild, and he essentially has lost two seasons to Tommy John surgery. I mean, this season now, to me, is a lost season for Cade Cavalli. You make two or three major league starts, that's a lost season. If there was one good thing about his Tommy John surgery, it was that it happened in March 2023, not, say, July 2023. You figured that Cavalli could at least be available for a good chunk of the 2024 season, but uh, that is not the case. Here's your Triple A report for the game played on Friday. Dylan Cruz 0 for 4 out of the leadoff spot, hitting third. Andres Chaparro had a double and drew a walk. Chaparro was who the Nats got in return for Dylan Floro from the Diamondbacks organization. Brady House 0 for 4 with a pair of strikeouts while playing third base. And pitch hitting 0 for 1, Jose Tana, one of the three players that the Nats got from the Cleveland Guardians in the Lane Thomas deal. Now back to the show. Here's the pitch. Abrams cracks one in the air, deep right center field. Way back it goes. At the wall, the center fielder Mitchell looking up, and it is gone. 
two run over for C.J. Abrams over the big wall in right center. It's now Milwaukee three in the Nationals two. Number 16 for Abrams. The Nats offense in this 8-3 loss to the Brewers on Friday evening, just three runs. Uh, now, the Nats did total 10 hits, which were a home run, a double, and eight singles. But the Nats drew just one walk, and the Nats went just one for 10 with runners in scoring position. Uh, the Nats scored two runs in the bottom of the third and a run in the bottom of the fourth. Uh, now, Friday was August 2nd. 2024, the two-year anniversary of the Nats trading outfielder Juan Soto and first baseman Josh Bell to the San Diego Padres, uh, among the six players who the Nats got back in that trade, of course, C.J. Abrams and James Wood. And the Nats' home run on Friday evening came from C.J. Abrams. Uh, He is the Nats' starting shortstop and number one batter, went one for five, but the one was a two-run homer. Abrams in the Nats, a two-run third, had a one-out two-run homer to right center field to cut the Nats deficit to 3-2. So, C.J. Abrams, great April, really bad May, great June, really bad July. By that pattern, he should have a great August. And sure enough, (laughs) he began his August with a two-run homer. And James Wood, he on Friday evening as the Nats starting left fielder and number three batter, went one for four with a single, a stolen base, two strikeouts, but also an outfield assist. Wood in the top of the third authored a 7-2 double play for the final two outs. So a high, high fly ball, shallow left. James Wood in and toward the line. He's under it now. He makes the catch. Contreras tags. He's trying to score. The throw in on one hop. The tag by Ruiz is in time for the out. And James Wood guns him down at home. And he in the bottom of that third inning had a two-out single through the right side of the infield. And he had a steal of second base. I mentioned the Nats totaling 10 hits. Five of the Nats 10 hits on Friday evening came from just two players, Luis Garcia Jr. and Juan Yepes. Luis Garcia Jr., he is the Nats starting second baseman and number five batter, went three for four with three leadoff singles, and he had a stolen base. He did commit a throwing error, but Garcia had a three-hit game to begin his August off a terrific July. Garcia in the Nats, one run fourth, had a leadoff full count single to right field despite having been down in the count at 1.02. And he had a steal of second base, but that single had an exit velocity per stat cast of 101.2 miles per hour, which was the Nats' fourth highest exit velocity of the game. Garcia in the bottom of the six had a leadoff single into right center field. That single had an exit velocity per stat cast of 110.7 miles per hour, what was the highest exit velocity of the game. Uh, and Garcia in the bottom of the eighth had a leadoff opposite field single to left field. Luis Garcia Jr. is gaining on C.J. Abrams in terms of OPS. Uh, Now, Abrams for this regular season is number one among all qualified Nats players in OPS at 787, but Garcia is number two at 752. Luis Garcia Jr.'s OPS as of games through July 2nd was just 675. As I just said, Friday was August 2nd. So Garcia in a month (laughs) raised his OPS from 675 to 752. And Juan Yepes, uh, he is the Nats starting first baseman and number two batter, went two for four with a double, a single, and a walk. Uh, Yepes in the bottom of the first had a went out first pitch, opposite field double to right field. Yepes in the bottom of the fifth had a went out single into left center field. And Yepes in the bottom of the seventh drew a one-out walk. Uh, Friday marked four weeks since the Nats on Friday afternoon, July 5th, announced having selected the contract of Juan Yepes from AAA Rochester. He since then has provided the following stats. 100 plate appearances, batting average of 348, on base percentage of 400, slugging percentage of 551. Outstanding. Also, with a run-scoring hit for the Nats on Friday evening was Ildemaro Vargas. He is the Nats' starting third baseman and number eight batter. Went one for four with an RBI single and a stolen base. of Vargas in the Nats' one-run fourth had a two-out RBI single into center field to tie the game at three, and he had a steal of second base. And K. Bear Ruiz did play. Uh, he was the Nats' starting catcher and number six batter. One for four with a single. K. Bear in the bottom of the six had a single up the middle on a one-two pitch. As you may recall, K. Bear Ruiz left the Nats' previous game, the 5-4 loss, 
at the Arizona Diamondbacks this past Wednesday due to taking a foul ball uh, to his uh, groin region. Uh, you can always email us, natschatpodcast at gmail.com. Being that I'm doing this installment of the podcast on my own, I thought that this would be a good chance to do some emails. Uh, email from Kevin Burke in Charlotte, North Carolina, writes Kevin, when is it time to start asking questions of Darnell Coles? The Nats cheaped out <laughs> on Kevin Long, and it seems like we've suddenly become good at developing pitching while taking a massive step back at the plate. Thank you for the email, Kevin. So, These final two months of this regular season are very big for multiple Nats players, especially catcher Kate Ruiz and starting pitcher Mackenzie Gore. But these final two months of this regular season also are very big for the Nats hitting coach Darnell Coles. Uh, As you may remember, the Nats last offseason parted with a number of coaches. Uh, Bench coach Tim Bogar, gone. First base coach Eric Young Jr., gone. Third base coach Gary DeSarcina, gone. Assistant hitting coach Pat Rossler, gone. But retained were pitching coach Jim Hickey and hitting coach Darnell Coles. And the retaining of Coles, I think, was particularly surprising. Now, we'll see how Nats pitchers do the rest of this season. But to me, Jim Hickey overall has done a good job this season. The combination of Hickey and pitching strategist Sean Doolittle has been good. We don't know enough about what Darnell Coles is and isn't doing and is and isn't advocating to say whether he's doing a bad job. But what we can say is that the Nats hitting for a third time in three seasons with Darnell Coles as hitting coach is not good. What's so difficult to assess is, is this because Coles is doing a bad job or is this because Coles has not had a lot to work with? It was interesting to me that Nats president of baseball operations and general manager Mike Rizzo in his appearance on the Sports Junkies on 106.7 The Fan on July 10th gave credit to Darnell Coles for C.J. Abrams hitting this season, Uh, although Abrams has been incredibly streaky this season. But, you know, we just talked about Luis Garcia Jr. He's having the best offensive season of his career. Doesn't Coles deserve at least some credit for that? I mean, if we're going to blame him for the bad stuff, then it's only fair that we give him at least some credit for the good stuff. But, you know, I think about what is happening with our old pal Victor Robles. Have you been following how former Nats outfielder Victor Robles is doing with the Seattle Mariners. Uh, The Nats on June 1st announced having requested unconditional release waivers on Robles, who they had designated for assignment on May 27th. He signed with the Mariners on June 4th. Victor Robles for the Mariners had the following stats as of games through Thursday. 85 plate appearances, batting average of 360, on base percentage of 422, slugging percentage of 520. He has been killing it for the Mariners. Now, Robles for the Mariners as of games through Thursday did have a BABIP, a batting average on balls in play of 417. <laughs> that is absurd. BABIP usually is around 300. A BABIP of 417 strongly suggests that he's benefiting from some good luck when it comes to the variance of the batted ball. But Victor Robles per stat cast, and this is interesting, has demonstrated a much faster bat speed with the Mariners than he did with the Nats. What is going on with Victor Robles with the Mariners? What is he being told by the Mariners? How is he being coached by the Mariners? Got to see if his success with the Mariners continues. But what's happening with Victor Robles is not a particularly good look for Darnell Coles. And here's the bottom line. The Nats in C.J. Abrams and James Wood and prospects Dylan Cruz and Brady House have a foursome that truly could prove to be like a core four offensively for the Nats for years to come. If the Nats have doubts about Darnell Coles, then they need to move on from him because what you don't want is bad or even mediocre coaching negatively impacting the likes of Abrams and Wood and Cruz and House. Now, if the Nats really and truly believe in Darnell Coles and really and truly believe that he is telling guys all the right things, all the right stuff, and some of these guys, maybe even many of these guys just aren't adhering to these things or can't do these things, 
Well, okay. But if the Nats have doubts about Darnell Coles, then get him away (laughs) from the foundational players, the stud prospects, and get a high-level, forward-thinking, hitting coach, even if it costs you some money, okay? As yes, like the emailer Kevin said, I've never liked how that Kevin Long situation went down. Kevin Long was the Nats hitting coach for four seasons, 2018 through 2021. He left the Nats to become the Philadelphia Phillies hitting coach, despite having been invited back by the Nats to be their hitting coach for the 2022 season. So he left on his own. It's not like he was fired. And this was off things having gotten rather strange between the Nats and Long in the 2020-2021 offseason. Kevin Long wanted a multi-year contract. The Nats would not give him a multi-year contract. The Nats told him that he could see if he could get a multi-year contract from another team. He, in that 2020-2021 offseason, did not. But it was very strange. It actually was reported at one point that he was out as Nats hitting coach, but he ended up returning as Nats hitting coach on a one-year contract, and then he was gone after that 2021 season. But Kevin Long, as you likely know, is known as a launch angle guru. He's known as the guy who transformed Daniel Murphy. Uh, Long was the New York Yankees hitting coach 2007 through 2014, was the New York Mets hitting coach 2015 through 2017. And you look at Kevin Long, he won a World Series with the Yankees in 2009, won an National League pennant with the Mets in 2015, won a World Series with the Nats in 2019, and won a National League pennant with the Phillies in 2022. Coincidence or not, good things seem to happen for teams when Kevin Long is hitting coach. Email from Dwayne Edwards in Virginia, writes Dwayne, with the trade deadline behind us and two-thirds of the season finished, I was curious about your feelings on the rebuild. Do you think that it is going according to plan, exceeding expectations, etc.? I have to be honest, Despite some progress this season, I feel worse about the future than I did when the season started. When the rebuild started, I think that most of us felt that 2025 was when we were going to be good again. At this moment, I no longer believe that that will be the case. What are your thoughts? Thank you for the email, Dwayne. So my overarching theme for this 2024 national season is that it is going to be a telling season for the rebuild. I said that about the 2024 season late last season. Uh, I said that about the 2024 season coming into this season. This is a telling season for the Nats rebuild. We entered this season with mixed results on the rebuild. There were reasons to think that the rebuild was going well. There were reasons to think that the rebuild was not going so well. The Nats 2024 season to me is a fork in the road season for the rebuild. And with 52 games left, in this Nats regular season, it still is not entirely clear whether the rebuild is truly going well. Now, I would say this. There this season, to me, are more good developments with the rebuild than bad developments. The problem is that there are enough bad developments to where you can't just say that the rebuild is going well, no questions asked. For the sake of brevity, all right, the good developments in the Nats rebuild this season include James Wood, Dylan Cruz, Brady House, C.J. Abrams, Luis Garcia Jr., Jacob Young, Jake Irvin, Mitchell Parker, D.J. Hers. The bad developments in the Nats rebuild this season include K. Bitt Ruiz, Josiah Gray. Now, that's due to injury, but uh, what has happened with him is bad. Uh, Mackenzie Gore, Cade Cavalli, again, due to injury, but what has happened with him is not good. And Jackson Rutledge. Now, Mackenzie Gore, as of a few months ago, was a good development in the Nats rebuild this season. And even with his season having fallen off, there this season still are more good developments with the rebuild than bad developments. But there are enough bad developments to where you can't just say that the rebuild is unequivocally going well. To say nothing of the record, you know, my hope was that the 2024 Nats would be like the 2022 Orioles, a team that doesn't necessarily make the playoffs, but does surprisingly contend for the playoffs and does demonstrate improvement to where you know that the rebuild is working. And you can't say that the Nats have done that this season, at least not yet. Now, there is time for that to change. 52 games left. 
But the Nats have a lot of work to do to make this a true breakout season in the rebuild. One of the undeniable realities about rebuilds in MLB is that when the rebuilds work, you really don't have to ask if they're working. You really don't have to wonder about if they're working. You just know that they're working because it's so glaringly obvious. We saw that over the last 10 years with the successful rebuilds of the Chicago Cubs and Houston Astros and Orioles. Those teams busted out of their rebuilds in ways that made it obvious that the rebuilds were working. Uh, We have not had that with the Nats. Not yet, anyway. You tell us what you think. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email us NatsChatPodcast at gmail.com. Game two for the Nats against the Brewers, Saturday afternoon at 4.05. DJ Hers will be the Nats starting pitcher. Now, there is a good bit of rain in the forecast for the Washington, D.C. area on Saturday. So we shall cross our fingers and uh, pay homage to the baseball gods and hope that uh, rain does not mess with this Nats-Brewers game on Saturday. Uh, you can find us on our website, NatsChatPodcast.com, at which you can purchase a Nats Chat podcast t-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. And we leave you now with this report from Jason Prill, the voice of the Lynchburg Hillcats, who are the single-A affiliate of the Cleveland Guardians. Jason is here to tell us about the two principal prospects in the three-prospect package that the Nats got for outfielder Lane Thomas in their trade with the Guardians this past Monday night. Uh, The two prospects, pitcher Alex Clemmy who at the time of the trade was the Guardians' number eight overall prospect per MLB pipeline and shortstop slash third baseman slash second baseman Rafael Ramirez Jr., who at the time of the trade was the Guardians' number 22 overall prospect per MLB pipeline. Hey there, Nationals fans. This is Jason Prill of the Lynchburg Hillcats. And you may be wondering, wait a second, what do the Lynchburg Hillcats of the Cleveland Guardians organization have to do with the Washington Nationals organization? Well, it's quite simple. You guys acquired two of our former players, Alex Clemmy and Rafael Ramirez Jr. in the Lane Thomas deal that took place on Monday evening. So I've been requested to provide a little bit of a scouting report on what Nats fans can expect going forward from Clemmy and Ramirez. We'll start first with Clemmy because quite frankly, he was one of my favorite prospects to watch this whole season in Lynchburg. He started out the year a little bit rough. He was struggling with his command and kind of getting pinched on the corners his walk rate went up but he had a high era and since then he has not had an era above three that's right may june and july were all sub three eras which is quite impressive for a kid who just turned 19 years old he's got a fastball a slider that's really nasty and those are his two main pitches he also mixes in a change up every now and then but He's getting stronger. He's getting better. He can sit in the mid-90s, can occasionally get up to 96, 97. And as a pitching prospect, he's probably going to become one of your highest ranked ones in the Nationals organization. Now to Rafael Ramirez Jr. The thing to think about for him is pop. He has a lot of power for a shortstop. Some people have estimated by the time he makes the major league level, he could be around a 20 plus home run per season kind of guy, which for a shortstop is really impressive. Now, he's another guy that's really young. He's only 19 years old, only a couple days different from Alex Clemmy, mind you. But he's had a slower start to his professional career. Don't get fooled by the average and don't get fooled by the errors you're going to see. This kid has a lot of talent. He's a lot of fun to watch. He plays with a lot of flair, a lot of excitement, energy. He's got a big smile. He comes from a professional baseball family. His father was a former all-star with the Atlanta Braves. And so he's got baseball pedigree in his genes. So that's going to be something that will serve him nicely. This year, he's still getting acclimated to the single A full season realm. I'll be following their career from the Guardians organization from here on out. And I can almost guarantee you, you guys are going to be excited about these two. 
Also, for those of you who are tuning in from Virginia, I've been told I'm allowed to plug tickets. That's right. If you want to come see Lynchburg play in Central Virginia, we do play the Fredericksburg Nationals on a regular basis, including right now this very week. You can get your tickets at lynchburg-hillcats.com. We'd love to have you in park because it's always a fun time at Bank of the James Stadium. So once again, you can get your tickets for this season and even looking ahead to next season when Fredericksburg comes to town a couple of times. You can get those tickets at lynchburg-hillcats.com. Thanks for having me, guys.